Guys, if you would do me a favor, what I want to do is a couple quick things here this morning, if you don't mind. I really do feel led to finish up where we were at last week. Um, but in the midst of that, if you don't mind, I want to take just a small, I don't even want to call it a detour, but maybe a stepping stone. Join me in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. You know, this is such a, a yeah, amen, everybody's bobbing their heads. Um, and, and I just want to share a little bit out of this passage of Scripture and and maybe we'll not even get to the, the second thing. And if not, I'll post that online. There were so many notes we didn't get to last week. But um, in the midst of, of all that's happening, in the midst of the celebration of our freedom, um, you know, Fourth of July is about the fact of independence, that we are independent, uh, that men made a choice to be able to break away from tyranny and to begin to establish a new place where that we can be free um, to have the liberties that we have. But again, they, they did it in such a way that they thought it was important to write the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence is this wonderful, wonderful, all of us know this document, of course, in this room. But it's a document that simply outlines the fact that this is what this country stands for. And when we say United States of America, one of the things that we have to reference is the Declaration of Independence. Because if you really want to know what the United States of America, why it got founded, the liberties that have been given to us, as those of us that are obviously residents or that we are, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Some of us were born here, but some of us got citizenship for a different way. If I want to know the rights of the country that I live in as a citizen, I go to the Declaration of Independence, which is this foundational document. And again, going back to foundations, which means that it's laid on the foundation and everything else is built upon top of that. Does that make sense? But what is so key to understand is that our founding fathers, the majority of them, were believers in God. And so before the foundation of the Declaration of Independence, there's this thing called the Word of God, which we are absolutely in love with. And so the Declaration of Independence is built on top of a, a lot of the principles found upon the Word of God. And it's interesting because of the fact that, you know, when you begin to take bricks out of a foundation, you have a struggle about the foundation. And of course, all of us would be able to recognize that our country has gone through so many struggles that uh, many things have come alongside and try to take out different blocks from the foundation of our country. So the value of life was taken out when they decided that abortion was okay. The power of prayer, that block was taken out. And that was a big block in my opinion. Why? Because see, that block was all about God. That block was about, about the very purpose of the very one that we love and, and that what we, who we care about. It was almost kind of like what we're saying is that as the word of God calls Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone, it was like, and this is what was the most devastating thing, they took the chief cornerstone out and they took prayer out. And what's interesting is that, you know, something can stand for a while when that cornerstone is gone, if one cornerstone is gone. Now again, for those that do not build something, so if you're going to be able to put a house in a new plot of land or anything like that, you find, you find the place that has the best, lowest part of the foundation, and that corner, everything else is built upon that corner. They throw a level off of that corner, and everything else is designed off of that corner. So if that cornerstone is gone, for a season it may look okay, but the minute you start putting weight on that corner is when you begin to realize the house is now off balance. And I think because of the fact that in man's ignorance, even though they thought, you know what, well, we can take God out of the equation and make this what we want it to be, I think now what we're realizing is that people are starting to be able to see that this nation is in trouble because it stopped, first of all, fearing the Lord, and it stopped trusting the Lord, and it stopped walking in obedience to the Lord. And because of that, we've got all kinds of chaos going on. And isn't it interesting, if you think about the fact of what it says, the Pledge of Allegiance, we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Think about the fact that this nation is no longer one. We find ourselves in the midst of a nation that defines itself as its own category, so therefore, somebody would say, you know what, I'm, I'm gay, and this is who I am and either accept me or don't accept me, but I'm not a part of you if you don't agree with my homosexual beliefs. Or somebody else may be able to say, you know what, I believe in abortion and it's okay to take a life even in the last term of, 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 their, of their existence, and this is who I am. And if you don't agree with me, that's your problem, so we don't have to agree, we don't have to be one. And so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. And we've seen the rise in this nation because we've taken this chief cornerstone out, the block which all is built upon, upon all kinds of false religions coming to a place where that false religions now say, hey, I have a right to. And so therefore you can't, you know, if someone says, hey, I'm a Buddhist or I'm a whatever it might be, it's amazing how much in the media you see people fighting to be able to say, hey, you have to recognize my religion. 
Even though these are not Christian religions in any way, shape, or form, they are fighting for their voice. And now all of a sudden there is confusion and upheaval in the land. And again, I believe it's because of the fact that, we, that things have happened where the chief cornerstones, foundations have been taken away. And whether we realize it or not, and nobody knows, but I want to be able to say that our nation, our foundations are crumbling in some respects. Just bottom line, I believe our foundations are crumbling in some ways. But let me share this with you, and please don't take this wrong. I love the United States of America. I am so privileged to have been born into this country. It is the greatest country ever. No way, shape, or form about it. But as I read this passage of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, I want to be able to point us to a greater nation that this passage is talking about. I believe it is the answer for the crumbling nation that we live in, and I believe, by the way, how many of you know that there is hope for the United States today? God is still on the throne. There is hope for our country today. I believe that with all of my heart, this hope for our country. I believe that God is changing things in different places all over the world, and I'm so glad to be able to see that. But this morning as we get started, I, I just want to take a look at this passage of Scripture, and I want to read this today as Christians in America, Christians in this United States. What does this passage say to us so let's just take a moment. Join me in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And this passage of Scripture, we've read this so many times, but I want to be able to say this passage is significant because it starts off with this word, if. And we'll talk more about that. It says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. One more time. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So, this passage of scripture starts off with this humongous if. How many of you know that that in the midst of course of life, even though we may want something that we want with all of our hearts, there's almost always an if statement before the thing. Does that make sense? It's not like the fact that you get to have your cake and eat it too. There's always a this and then conversation. The fact that if, if you do this, then these things will, will follow. These things can be expected. And what I love about the Word of God is that when you read the if statements, you know that they're a guarantee. There isn't this conversation where God says, you know, if... And if I feel like it, see, God doesn't add an if to his name. It's an if to us. So if you do this, God's not saying, well, you know what? If, it's, if it happens on a Thursday about 4 o'clock, I'll bless it. He doesn't do that. He just says, if you do this, then I will follow through and I will do all of this. See, anytime God makes an if statement, it's a completion statement. But the completion statement starts with I. Think about that for a second. When God says if, that I is you and I. If we do this, God will finish it and complete the rest of it. But it has to start with I. It has to start with you and me as individuals. And, and I think that's such an important conversation because, again, I think a nation is as strong as its people. Would we all agree with that? But the people are as strong as their values. And their values are as genuine as the God that has given them their values. You cannot separate those things. There's no way, shape, or form. Because as I look at this, and again, I use this term here every once in a while, how many of us in this room would agree this is absolute truth? Absolutely. See, this is a big, this, thank you, amen. This is absolute truth. I, I don't care what anybody wants to argue with me. I don't care what philosopher comes to be able to say that it's suggested truth or situational. No, none of that. This is absolute truth. I believe it's without error as well, by the way, because see, if it's absolute truth, it has to be without error, Amen. There may be things that you and I don't understand, and that's okay because we may not ever understand those things till we get to heaven, but it's important to be able to say that this is absolute truth and it's without error because, see, the minute that you allow something to be questioned is the minute that the integrity and the fabric and the substance of that thing becomes less than what it's supposed to be. And we know the power of that because we look at what happened when the way that sin came into the world. Satan did one thing. He made Eve question the voice of God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the voice of God to our nation in 2017. And what is so beautiful about it that it's still speaking. And it still works. And so again, when he says this passage, if my people, 
Now, I think it's interesting because of the fact that when we read this scripture and when people attach this to the United States of America, I do want to clarify something with a lot of grace here. It doesn't say, if the United States. It, this is something that's really, really key. It doesn't simply say that, whatever, if, if Jeff, which is called by my, it doesn't, so it doesn't say, if Jeff does this, humble themselves and pray, it doesn't mean that he'll get all these answers after this. Because notice the qualifier. So again, if my people, which are called by my name, there's two distinctive things that define the people. So again, to be able to say that, to be able to say that I'm, I'm a born-again Christian, but yet to be able to, in that moment, to be able to say that I don't honor the name of God, though, but I call myself a Christian, but I don't honor the name of God. Can that really be so? It can't be, because see, the proof of what you believe is, is how you live. And so when this conversation, if my people, which are called by my name, which means they have an identifying mark based upon how they live their life, and I want to be able to say the identifying mark that God has put upon us as born-again Christians is exactly the qualifier for this conversation of if. And so if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you have been marked with his name. This is something that is so important. So when God looks at your name, he doesn't just look at Corey Buckland or Julie Buckland or John Buckland. He looks at this mark next to it that says Jesus paid it all. And that means that you are marked by his name, which means that you are his but see, the name still carries weight, even if the world doesn't want to acknowledge it. And this is what is a little bit concerning by the, by the fact of the foundations going away, because the word Christian now, which, which used to identify the church, that name has lost value in these days. And it's concerning because the name is attached to the one that gave us the name. See, Christians means little followers of Jesus Christ. And so unfortunately, because the person of Jesus Christ has become devalued, the name that we have been marked with has become devalued. But I want to be able to say to you, though, that this scripture is a promise to us that because of the fact that we have the power. I, I think it's interesting because I don't, I don't want to ever get the opinion that if sinful, unrepentant man begins to do these things, that something will change. It's only a people that are called by his name. And because you are called by his name means that you are his people. You are, we are a people of a peculiar kingdom that this world does not know, but we are God's people. And what is so powerful is that if we've given our life to Jesus Christ, we're called by his name and we're people, then we are people of power. Why? Because we have access to an if promised by God. Do you understand that? Because we are his children, because you are his child. So whatever you're going through in life, you have access to an if promised by God based upon the DNA of your bloodline that you got through Jesus Christ. So it's not based upon us and our own works, but it's based upon his promise. And so we're already qualified to receive the promise because we're children of God. And this is why I think the church is starting to hopefully waken up to the fact that because God has saved us for a remnant in 2017. Do you ever think about yourself as that? That God has preserved you as a remnant for 2017? Why weren't you born in 1817 or, or 1917 or whatever it might have been? You were born and you are living in 2017. And so you are an if promise of God walking this earth. Right now, you and I are an if promise of God walking this earth. There's something very significant about that in my own opinion. I think time and time again, why wasn't I born back in the 30s and the 40s? I like older music and I like a slower lifestyle, but yet God had me birthed in these moments. And so therefore, it is my privilege, humbly and fearfully, to be able to share the word of God in the years of 2017. But what I have to understand, what we have to understand, is that we walk as an if-promised people. And so the word that I'm sharing is God's word, not my word. But this is so powerful because of the fact that he made the promise. There's power in the promise. And so let's look at the promise for a little bit. So again, so we're, how many of you are God's people in this room? We're all God's people. Do you, are you marked by his name? Amen. All of us in this room are marked by his name. So this is what happens. So because of the fact that we are his people and we are called by his name, there's this next step. So we're already qualified, right? Because we're his people, we're called by his name. But there's this next step. 
And the next step is says that if my people are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So, so step number one, we have to come into a place of humility. We're talking about this in our Bible study this morning. We have to come into a place of humility. And again, that place of humility is coming into a place of total surrender. Total surrender to, to God and to his will and to his way. Now, I want to be able to say that in the conversation of humility, I want to be able to say that humility cannot be defined just by the actions. Humility is birthed out of a heart place. Does that make sense? Humility is birthed out of a humble heart, a heart that is recognized and realized of his lostness without Jesus Christ. And because God has come into his life, a humble heart understands the dependency that you have upon Jesus. So humility and dependence go hand in hand for the rest of our life, for the absolute rest of our life. And we're talking today a little bit this morning again about the conversation about be still and know that I am God. There is a need to be able to understand that in life, there is one place that I bow down, one God, the only one person that I bow down to, whether there is a stillness and a place of humility of refreshing. And so as we think about the fact that we need to be humble, that is such a powerful and tricky word, isn't it? Because see, it comes in so many forms. I know what it's like to think that I'm walking humbly and then all of a sudden trip over myself. Do you know what I mean by that? I know what it's like to think I'm walking humbly and I'm walking in God's grace and then all of a sudden I realize I've done something and I trip over myself and I think to myself, what in the world happened there? And God began to speak to my heart. Maybe it was a situation where, Ben, you started getting prideful about something in your life or you started judging somebody else or you allowed hatred to come in, or division to be able to come in, or you, whatever it might have been, but you allowed a foreign substance to come into that started to affect your humbleness. You started to try to manage a situation, you started to, whatever the case might be. And what's interesting is the fact that this happens in so many small, distinctive ways. I was watching it during God and Country, and I was so thankful for what was happening in those moments. And I thought to myself, Lord God, in the allness, in the aw- awesomeness of these big booms, and and all these powerful lights, I thought, Lord God, do we recognize how small we are in the midst of these big booms? Big booms, they're bouncing off the, uh, the, um, what's the tree line, they're coming back towards the building, and they were catching us in the middle. And I thought to myself, Lord God, this is the power that is in you, that Lord God, when you do something, when you speak, it shakes us to the very core of who we are. That's that conversation of what it is to be humble, is that when he speaks, we get into a place of, Lord God, what are you saying in this moment? And the continual dependence upon him. But again, the first attribute is humbleness. Humbleness. And it says, humble themselves. And the second thing is this. If we do that, and we also, in the midst of humility, we pray. How many of you know you really can't genuinely pray without humility? We can pray, but that's talking to God, not talking with God. When we pray in humbleness, I'm saying, that's talking with God. When I pray without humbleness, that's not talking with God, that's me talking at God. And there's just this simple need to be able to be transparent with God. I think there's no other, and this is what the nation needs. Let me say this, I think the nation needs a stripping back to the very core of who we are and what's really going on on the inside so that clearly we could see where has the infection come from? Where has the problem come from? Because I want to be able to say in the passage of this scripture, God didn't give you this promise because he kind of wants to do it. He absolutely wants to do it. This if promise, Jesus died for this if promise. So this was on the forethought of God's mind when Jesus died on the cross. He wanted to come and to be able to heal the land of his people. God wanted to bless the land of his people and make it a prosperous land. But only his will and his way is to be able to do that though. See, that's the whole point of the humbleness is that it has to happen his way. And so in the conversation of, Lord God, if I humble myself and pray, I think it's interesting because part of the aspect of prayer is hearing the will of God. Part of the aspect of prayer is understanding, God, what do you want to do in this situation? I think there are times in my prayer life where God just lovingly sits there and listens to me and listens to me and listens to me. And then after a while, I say, okay, so are are you done? Because I got some answers for all the stuff you're praying for. Just give me, you know, just are you done for a second? We all do that. And see, I think humbleness can be some of the fact that we're so consumed with us and with what we think we need and with what we think we're going through that we don't see him as the source of hope for what we're going through or the answer for what we're going through. Now, by his grace, we eventually get there. 
But humbleness recognizes that when I go into prayer, I'm going into a place of submission to the God that knows it all, that has all the answers. See, that's the power of it. It's about a positioning to the fact that, God, when I come before you, I come before the God that knows everything and that has the power to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. And so therefore, I don't want to be able to come in with carrying a bag of complaints. I want to be able to come in and just say, Lord God, what is thy will in this moment? Thy kingdom come. What's thy will in this moment, Lord God? It's funny because of the fact that God will do something peculiar to be able to change a nation. He may have you march around the walls. He may send a boat or a ship to preserve a whole entire nation through one, in, one little family, possibly. I don't know how he's going to do it, but the minute that we think we know how he's going to do it, that's exactly the minute that we're probably in trouble. And so we, we can't sit there and shake our hand at government and say, straighten up. Get it right. It's not going to work. What has to happen is that God may do it in a peculiar way through a common purpose. How many people in the Bible do you look at and realize they were never superstars, but God used them? People walking this earth, they were never amazing people. All of them had flaws. Everybody from Moses to Elijah to Elisha to Jacob to Esau. But yet God used the normal people in powerful ways. And look about this. When God does something, he doesn't just do it for one person. He does it for the nations. He does it for the people around us. And they get to the point of the church, ladies and gentlemen, we have to realize, and I believe that we do, but we have to be conscious when we come to God on behalf of our nation. We're not asking him just to do what we want to do. He wants to do something through us that's going to affect the rest of the world around us. And don't, don't this is what I think is so interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who has a large, large church, and things are going... It's so funny because sometimes the bigger church thinkers just, oh, this, this is great. But they're going through so many different things that we don't realize. But we were talking about the fact of his struggle right now. He said, but my number one struggle is to do something greater than what I did last week. I thought to myself, wow, really? He said, people are always clamoring for a bigger message and something more flamboyant on Sunday. And he doesn't want to do that. This is a man with a great heart, a great heart. And he said, we have to always pull back the reins sometimes to be able to say that what God did in the moment in that thing is still working right now and to allow people to absorb that. He said, Ben, in so many ways, you're so lucky because of the fact that you've got a smaller congregation. He said, it's interesting because some of the greatest moves of God come from the most unexpected places. And he said, it's interesting because it's, it's easier sometimes for a smaller group of people to be able to hear a continued voice of God and to be able to expect him to do the supernatural in a very, very powerful way. He said, never, ever forsake small beginnings. Because in a place of small beginnings, whether it's 12 people that Jesus pull, pulls aside to be able to say we're going to share the gospel with the nations, whatever it might be, never, ever, ever underestimate small beginnings. And I think about the fact that God wants to do a supernatural thing through a people of, of just uniqueness, no matter who we are, where we've come from, but this conversation of humility and prayer. It's the place that we stay, not the place that we visit. This is what I love about this passage of Scripture. He doesn't put a time frame on it. He doesn't say, well, if you do it for five minutes a day, every couple times a week, that's fine. It's a constant place that we live in, that we exist. So as I'm driving my truck down the road, hauling a low of steel, and I'm praying for what God is doing, I'm doing it with a humble heart, as an if-promised child of God, knowing that as I'm doing this, God has promised to follow up with what I'm doing and to begin to heal this land. See, this is not dependent upon the non-believer. It's dependent upon us. This has nothing to do with the non-believer. I mean, the results of it will at some point. But the if promise is about it being birthed in us. And it's humbling and it's powerful. And I want to be able to say that sometimes we, we want to see all these humongous things happening. I think some of the biggest things that are happening is what Rosie recognized. That I know Rosie. I know that he prays on his trips. I know that he prays on his route. I know that he does that. He prays for the houses that he travels by. And I think about the fact that that's where new things begin to start. The ability to be able to pray as you're traveling down the road for somebody about, Lord God, your will be done in that family. Because again, I believe that a nation has changed one person at a time. Let's never underestimate the power of humility in prayer. Humble themselves and pray. And then the last next thing he says, and seek my face. What does it mean to seek the face of God? To be able to seek the face of God. I love that passage of scripture, but I want to be able to say 
So to be able to seek a face is to be able to discover a countenance. Do you know what I mean with that? Let me just clarify. One of the things as a father that I really strive to do is to seek the face of my kids every day. Let me clarify. So in my home, people are working, people are getting married here soon, all kinds of stuff. And my kids are coming in from all different situations, all the time. They're coming in at different times of day, throughout the day. And if I'm home, no matter what's going on, if we're watching TV, if I'm in the kitchen helping with food, or ever I'm doing a chore at the house, I always stop what I'm doing. And I say, hey, how was your day? And my kids have learned that if they answer me as they're walking upstairs to their bedroom, that's not what dad's after. Because it's one thing to be able to say it with your voice, but when you come to me and you say it with your eyes, there's a connection that begins to happen. Because see, I can always, if I can see your face, I can see your countenance. And it's amazing to watch my kids to understand. I had a, Olivia the other day was, came home and she lives across the street from us now. She has her own little place over there. And she comes over and she eats our food. I'm great with that. Eats our food, does her laundry at our house, watches our television. Pff, do that as long as you want to. I'm happy with all that. But she came home from work the other day, and I said, hey, how was your day? And she started to go to the kitchen to make some food, and she stopped, and she goes, you probably want me to come tell you in person, don't you? I said, yes, I really do. And so, and to be able to help her to understand that what's important to me is the countenance of your eyes. I want to be able to see truly what's going on in your heart. Because see, as we look at the face of God, it's amazing how the fact that the face of God has so much life and so much truth, and it's amazing what you see in the eyes of God begins to set you free on the inside. And I want to be able to say that I find his face, face constantly in the Word of God. His face does not change. His face does not grimace with fear. His face does not grimace with anxiety. It's constant and it's steady. And it changes my perspective to be able to get into the face of God. And so to be able to seek the face of God is part of seeking His way. No other way around it. We've got to be able to seek His way. But to seek His face is to find His heart. That's what I think is so beautiful. That's what happens with me and my kids. I don't want them just to find my voice. I want them to encounter my heart in that moment. Because as a father, I'm realizing that these heart moments are getting less and less because they're getting busier and busier and busier and busier. And if I had my way as a father, I would take every day, once a day, at least with my kids, to be able to get them in front of me and just to be able to say, how are you doing today? See, as a father, I want to know how they're doing. I want to know what they need in this moment. I want to be able to say that that's exactly what God is saying here, is that if you encounter him as father, if you come to him as father, he's engaging in you to be able to display to you his heart. Because there are times when my kids just need to know that when they share something tragic with me, that my response is, oh, Lord God, I hope this works out. What my kids want to be able to hear from me is, God's got this. It's going to be okay. God is bigger than this situation. He's a God that will never fail you, never leave you, never forsake you. He's unshakable. He's unmovable about his opinion about you. And I want to be able to say to this church, that's exactly what God says to you in the midst of all the stuff that you're going through. As you look at this promises of God, that when you find his face, you find a face of strength. Because his eyes and his heart are true and they're pure. And he's unmovable about what he's doing about in your life and in this nation. And just because the rest of the nation may not catch a hold of the fire of the goodness of God, but we do, we already have it. It's like being 30 to 50 to 100 steps ahead of the nation. How many of you feel like that? But isn't it interesting the media will make you feel like you're so far out of it and that you don't count and you're so irrelevant? But the truth based upon the word of God, because we're his if people marked by his name and called to his purpose, we're a gazillion steps ahead. Isn't that powerful to know that? It's almost kind of like if you knew what we knew. But that's the whole key to the church. We need to be able to tell them the greatest secret that we have, and it's Jesus Christ. And again, this is the thing about this. He says, if they again, by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. I love the fact that we as a church are already a thousand steps ahead because we're already called by his name and marked by his name. But the key thing that God is trying to do, he doesn't want to change the world from the outside in. He wants to do it from the inside out. And so God wants to be able to change the bitter, broken, deceived hearts of the world because it still works the same way. And so as we're praying for humility for ourselves, we need to be able to pray for humility to those that are lost because that is the stumbling block. 
They need humility. They need a reality check. They need to be awakened in that, just like you and I needed to be awakened in that. And this is what God is saying. The way that you pray is, just, is not just the way that, again, I think one of the most powerful ways that we pray is how we live. Amen? One of the most powerful ways that I pray is how I live. And so if I'm really living in a place that, Lord God, I want to honor your word by doing your word, that is one of the most powerful, because again, actions speak louder than words ever will. And so I think that conversation of, Lord God, as I live this way according to your word, and as I pray for this nation, as I pray for my president, one of the things I always pray for Donald Trump is his humility level. I do all the time. Why? Because he's such a strong man. I think it's probably one of the biggest things he probably deals with is humility. But yet it's his greatest strength, isn't it? He makes decisions in the face of all kinds of opposition and doesn't seem to bother him much. He probably sleeps really well at night. He's been through all this preparation to do this thing in this moment that God wants him to do. And I celebrate what God is doing in this man's life. And one of the things I pray for him is the issue of humility. And just, Lord God, keep him humble. And what does that mean? God, keep him dependent. Keep him dependent upon you. I think it's interesting because there's no other place of strength than prayer. I mean, there's just, a, there's, there's so much power in prayer and in the word to be able to give us a place of strength, to be able to make difficult decisions in the midst of a world that doesn't see things the way that we see it. So again, he says, stumble, humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then this conversation of turn from their wicked ways. There's another qualifier in this thing. Turn from their wicked ways. This is such a big issue. And, and this is what is so beautiful about this, though, is that how many of us would understand that if I really found the heart of Jesus Christ, the natural component of that is turning from my wicked ways? I, I think there's a... Some people struggle with that statement. And maybe I'm still working that out in my own flesh a little bit, but I want to be able to say that I have discovered that, that, that real heart change changes my actions. That, that, that conversation of, of the fact that, you know, <laughs> I want to do what I don't do it kind of thing, but yet at the same time, I know that God's working in me to equip me to be able to do what I know I should do in the midst of the struggles that I have. So even though my body's not perfect, my heart and my countenance has been changed by God's grace, and so I desire to be able to do His will in the midst of my imperfections. See, what we're mad about the world is that they're not doing the right thing. Why are they doing that stupid stuff? Why are they doing that? Well, again, actions come from a place of, of a heart position. And this is why the whole conversation of humility doesn't happen in the heart. It, it will never change the way that we do things. You know, I, I think about all the analogies of what God, I think, is trying to do in our country. And I think, Lord God, is it a heart transplant? You know, that whole situation, is it a heart transplant? Is it, a, is it a bypass surgery that you're trying to do? God, what do, you, what do you want to do in our nation? Because, see, the heart was founded on a good thing. But what is it, Lord God, that has gotten us so off the course? And then God reminds me at times, God reminds me in his humble and loving way that not all men are going to be saved. I don't always like that. God doesn't want it to be that way. He wishes that all men would be saved. But the reality is that not everybody's going to come to Jesus Christ. It's just not going to happen that way. But this is the glory of the gospel. All have the potential to do so. Whosoever will gets to come. And so as we're praying for this nation, and we're praying, Lord God, change this nation, what we're saying, Lord God, is heal the heart of this nation. God, give them your heart. But there are some that their hearts are so hard, they will never come to Jesus Christ. But you know the glory about that is that you and I don't have to worry about knowing who that is. We just have to continue to minister and let the love of God flow through our life as we humbly pray for this nation and as we expect the promise. I think it's so powerful. Um, it's interesting when you think about the fact of where does revival start? Where, do, where does a changed nation start? Well, it starts with a changed people, correct? And it starts with a changed people that live in a, in a land. How many of you know that's us? I, I just can't get over that this morning a little bit about the fact that that, that, that we are God's people, we live in this land, some of you live farther than Putnam County, but, but we live in this place, and so therefore, because we're walking in humility, and we're praying, we're seeking his face, and we're turning from our wicked ways, he's hearing us from heaven. 
Right this very moment, God hears your prayers from heaven. And what is so powerful is that he's forgiven your sins and he's in the process of healing our land. That is beautiful. And so that means that it's your land and my land. He's healing the lands. And what is so important is that if the lands are not healed, they cannot produce substance to be able to have plentiful things to live upon. And God is beginning to heal the hearts and the minds of men and women. And people are looking at your prosperity and how you live and the goodness of God in your life. And this is what is so powerful. That I think God is using that to draw them to a place of repentance. I really believe that. Many people that I encounter these days are just looking for someone that just someone that loves, someone that really has a sense of what is it that really works. I, I, I sit around young people all the time and I, I teach a USAM, a school ministry class on Saturday mornings and we're getting ready to kick back into our fall season again. I have about 35 students on Saturday mornings and we just talk about pastoral stuff. We talk about kingdom dynamics and we talk about worldviews and what it is to have a worldview as a Christian, as a Christian believer. And the bottom line is this, is that, look, we're not the same. We're just not. We have this potential DNA because we're all come from Adam. And we all have the possibility of being born again Christians, but there is this division line. And unfortunately, when people don't get saved, they're not walking with God. And we have to stop expecting them to do the things that we think they should do. It's just not going to happen. But at the same time, in the midst of that conversation, I think there's a world walking around asking themselves, what really works? What really works? In a counseling room, you get to see people at their, at their lowest points sometimes that, that really get to the point of saying, one of the most powerful questions you can ask somebody is, is how you're living, is it working? Is it really working? Like how you're, how you're treating your wife and how you're treating your kids and how you treat your boss and, and how you treat your parents and how you treat your family and how you treat your neighbor. How's that really working in your life? Is it really, really working? And I think in the midst of the conversation of is it working, I think God begins to be able to stir and people come to a place of reality, of true honesty to be able to see, no, this isn't working anymore. This isn't going the way that I expected it to. Well, I'm absolutely in trouble. Because see, the very first thing when people realize they're in trouble, that's when they go for help. So as a church, I think the biggest thing we need to be able to pray for is to help the world to realize they're in trouble. They're in trouble. And there's a God that can answer their problems and answer their hope and be able to cure and heal their land. So what do we do with it right now in 2017 at Faith Assembly? What do we do with this passage of Scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? What is it? What do we do with this? I want to be able to share a couple things. We know that it works. Amen. We live this out. And we stay constant with it. We stay constant with it. 